right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Angie Schmidt. I um, am a board member at Bike Cleveland, and I work for an organization called Streets Blog. And Streets Blog is based in New York. We are the voice of the livable streets movement throughout the United States. Um, we have blogs in New York, Washington, San Francisco, and LA, and we are moving on one in Chicago. And um, I'm just here to introduce Mark Gordon, who um, is the founder of Streets Blog and a organization called Open Plans, which is based in New York. They also run street films. Um, you may have seen those videos on the internet. And um, Open Geo, which is a leader in um, real-time transit data applications. Um, Mark is um, sort of a genius. He has degrees from Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. He is... Um, a technology entrepreneur. He founded LimeWire, um, if you remember that program. And now he runs a um, quantitative trading firm um, that just recently the Huffington Post called him the man that's beating Wall Street. He's been very active in New York City's effort to become more bike friendly and the revolution that's occurred there over the last five years as um, an advisor to um, transportation alternatives and through his work with these nonprofit organizations. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, th thank you, Angie. Um, yeah, hi, I am, I'm Mark Gorton. Uh, Let's see. Oh, uh, for my for my day job, I run Tower Research Capital, which is a, a quantitative trading firm. But my passion for the really the past decade has been the livable streets movement and transportation reform. Um, I sort of stumbled into this accidentally. I never really thought I'd be going around talking about this. But I, I'm I'm a cyclist. I ride to work every day. And if you ride on the streets of, of New York City every day, you almost get killed a few times. It, it, it kind of got it gets you thinking, like, why are streets so screwed up? Why are they dangerous for cyclists? Why are they so hostile to pedestrians? And this put me on a, on a journey where I started try, questioning the way our streets are programmed and thinking more about transportation. And then I started learning about, you know, <laughs> traffic engineering, land use planning, uh, all sorts of, you know, transportation planning, all sorts of different ways, studying the history of transportation in, in, in lots of cities around the world. And, and I came to a, a set of conclusions that you know, not in this country and really around the world, not only are we um, using the car wrong in cities, we're not just a little bit wrong, but we really are, have been fundamentally wrong in how we have done our, our transportation planning in, in, in cities. And I, um, I've been very active in the livable streets movement in New York City. Um, oh, well, this is a, a picture of First Avenue. This is sort of the, the you know, the, the life that we have in New York City. I mean, this is, um, you know, the congestion that, that we have regularly there. And, and we've done a lot to, to degrade the human living environment. If you look here, these are air conditioners and these windows. These are people's apartments. This is people's homes. Like, you know, when kids walk out their front door, this is the world that we live in. It's because it's a traffic choke world, and and we've managed through the 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 really kind of mindless promotion of the automobile in cities to really significantly degrade the human living environment. And so, um, I. Um, was fortunate enough to make a, a, enough um, money in my, in my uh, trading businesses that, I, that I've been able to fund open plans and some other organizations in New York City. And back in 2005, uh, we founded something called the New York City Streets Renaissance Campaign. And back um, probably before then, just to give a little context, there was very much a sense that New York's a, a big city. It's got a lot of traffic. What are you going to do about it? But there were a bunch of us who, who thought that there was a better way to, to plan transportation in New York City. And we launched the New York City Streets Renaissance Campaign. We put, a, uh, put together a big exhibit at the Municipal Arts Society with big, beautifully, graphically produced boards. We put out videos. Uh, we launched Streets Blog and Street Films to promote these set of ideas that included transportation practice, best practices from around the world. We talked about um, the 
the bicycle network in, in Copenhagen about bus rapid transit in, from Bogota and congestion pricing from London and brought together best practices that were really not familiar to most people in, in New York City at that time. And we also started, I mean, through Streets Blog, um, we, we put a real spotlight on the, the practices of the New York City Department of Transportation, which was pretty backwards. A lot of this kind of 1950s traffic engineer style mentality where, you know, which has the effect of making streets dangerous for people to cross, making it hard for kids to walk to school, hard to cycle. And even in terms of moving people around, because cars are so spatially inefficient in, in, a, in a dense city, it's actually not good for moving people because you're squeezing out other modes that are more spatially efficient, like buses and, and bicycles and, and things like that. And we were basically able to embarrass the previous commissioner of the Department of Transportation into resigning. And we um, had also created a set of policy expectations um, about what could happen in New York City. And Mayor Bloomberg um, appointed a, a great uh, commissioner, uh, Jeanette Sadakan. I mean, so basically within almost 18 months of uh, us starting this campaign, the, we got the city to pretty much adopt a lot of the things we were we were pushing for, which is probably uh, you know practically a record in, in advocacy, and one of the first things that Jeanette Sadakan did is that she went and hired for her senior staff a number of the people who had been working to overthrow the previous uh, Department of, of Transportation, a, a Commissioner of the Department of Transportation, and so then they brought all these uh, really energetic young people into uh, New York City DOT, and they proceeded to do a lot of amazing things. Um, I mean, probably the biggest and most, most prominent of them is that they closed Times Square to traffic. So they closed Broadway, and um, you know, what you have here, you know, a major avenue right through the, the middle of, of Times Square in Manhattan closed and now fully pedestrianized. Um, I mean, th this was really transformative in the neighborhood. It's been an enormous success. Everyone that works there loves it because the sidewalks were unbelievably congested before, and now you can actually walk around. There's pleasant places when you go outside. The tourists love it. it you know, it helps make a better destination. The businesses really love this because now people are, are actually, you know, stopping and spending time in Times Square. Retail rents in Times Square are up 35% in the last 12 months alone, and probably twice that since they... Um, since they closed uh, Broadway. Um, New York is also now building out a, a comprehensive pr protected cycle network. Um, and what they've done is, so this is, I'm guessing this is probably 8th Avenue here. They, um, they used to be that there was a row of parked cars here. They, they basically, with mostly paint, kind of pushed out this row of parked cars, as you sort of see here, put in these little pedestrian islands, and you, they use the, the parked cars to protect the cyclists from traffic, which in New York City, where you have you know, huge amounts of traffic, is re really you know, taken some streets that were very, very dangerous to cycle on and, and made them safe, you know, safe enough that, that I will cycle on stuff like this with my uh, nine-year-old daughter. And so... I mean, it's, and they're building this out across the city at, at a pace that's really very ambitious. And, and it's had an enormous impact. Cycling um, is up probably about 150% in the last five years in, in New York City. You, you just see more cyclists a, everywhere. And now they're, they just announced they're rolling out um, bike share um, with uh, 10,000 bikes and 600 uh, stations that they're, that they're, and that's coming this summer. Um, they also have done a huge number of things, a, a lot of uh, uh, temporary street closures, um, everything from uh, they, block parties, they have these things called weekend walks, summer streets, where in neighborhoods, they, you know, they, this, this is on a regular basis is just filled with traffic. They close the, 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 the street to cars and people come out and people really get to experience this great urban lifestyle, you know, where, you know, you get to meet your neighbors, you know, kids have a place to play. We're normally in, in a situation where kids don't have anywhere to go or it's hard, you know, where it's a big uh, drag to get them to the park or something like that. And, and these programs have been very, very successful. And they've also helped give people a taste of what livable streets are really like and what the options are in the world, that it doesn't have to be traffic all the time. And, and we're really starting to, to learn and experience this. And lots and lots of other things, uh, slow speed zones, um, the, they're, they're rolling out in, in neighborhoods across the city, um, which does a lot to, to uh, 
make streets safer and, and better for, for non-motorists. These little things like these little pop-up cafes here, this used to be four parking spots. Now they, they, they push out the, the, the curb, take the parking, and, and, it's, and it's space for people. And it's lots and lots of innovations like this. We, um, we are, are rolling out our own version of bus rapid transit. Cleveland's still a little ahead of us in that front, but we're, we're catching up. Um, and, and so the lessons that I have um, learned in New York, I realize apply to a, a lot of other cities because, I mean, New York is certainly different than, um, than a lot of other cities. It's, it's denser. We have congestion problems that other people uh, than other cities don't have. But the, the same problems living with the automobile and the fact that the automobile has had such a profound impact on the city, a lot of these things are, are universal in, in dense cities. And, and I mean, in city after city, you had a situation where the automobile was embraced as being the wave of the future. There was this suburban ideal. Everyone would move out of the city. And, and what ended up happening was that you know, we ended up with, with a lot of unintended, unanticipated consequences, and the, and the cities themselves have really suffered. And now, we, after a, a hundred years' experience with the automobile, we're learning that just this wholehearted embrace of the automobile is, is very much uh, a double-edged sword, and and that you that you really have to start planning cities for for people and really thinking about that and and. and deliberately doing things to make life tougher for drivers if you want to have a more livable city. And, and, and the, the, if, as I study the history of this stuff, what, what I've come to realize is that the transportation policies in, in our country have, have basically been dominated by the, the auto and oil industries. And, and what you had is that as early as the 1920s, the, the car manufacturers realized that there was a problem that cars didn't fit in, in cities, that there was horrible congestion and, and all these things. And, and over the course of the 20s and 30s, they, they sort of were, were brewing up in their heads what the, the solution to this problem was. And then after World War II, they, they unveiled the, the, these, these sets of ideas where you would basically reinvent the idea of the city. And the idea, I mean, all of this was pioneered in Detroit, which embraced the automobile like no other place. And the idea was that you would run highways right into the heart of the city and basically then rebuild your city in a sprawled out manner at densities that were low enough to accommodate driving. And if you look at the thought behind this planning, the people who are coming up with the, the urban planning model that has dominated this country for the last 60 years, their goal was to sell cars. They really were not particularly concerned with what city livability was like. And in fact, to them, the city was almost outmoded. It was something to be discarded. And now what we found is that it's actually not so good if you discard your cities. A lot of really bad things happen, and there's a lot that's, that's right at the core with cities, but, it's, but the automobile and the city still have this fundamental problem. And this is, this is a uh, picture from Google Earth uh, of Cleveland where you have, you know, very nicely run highways, you know, right into the heart of the city. And, and all this traffic, th this traffic that goes right into the city is, is very damaging for the human living environment. So the, you know, people walking down the street, cyclists, all of that, the, the vibrant street life that used to, to exist on all the streets of, of Cleveland and, and, and cities all around the world has really been scraped away. And, and we, we've, in large sense, poisoned the living environment of our cities with the automobile. They become dead places that aren't good places for people anymore. And, and cities are really all about people. So there is this, this horrible side effect. Um, and we've turned our streets into roads. So streets are, are places where people live, where they shop, where, you know, where kids play. And roads are, are something that just connects between two separate places that aren't places in and of themselves. But the, the, the street design techniques we use are, are, are all of, they're, they're, they're basically highway engineering techniques that have been applied to cities where the roads are straight, distraction free, free where they're all about moving as many cars as possible, um, as fat, as quickly as possible, but that has had the effect of destroying the sense of place on those streets and, and it's been very, very dysfunctional. Um, 
And it's, it's also important to understand that the automobile is really spatially incompatible with a dense city. And I mean, this is a, a nice picture that shows, shows the amount of pe space it takes to move 60 people by car, by bus, or, or by bicycle. And even in cars, this is actually worse than this because when they start moving, they, they, they spread out more than this. And also cars, you know, even once you get where you're going, you have to park them. And you just see that, you know, the amount of space for the people, it's dwarfed that your, tr your space consumed by your transportation system is, is just much more than the actual people them themselves take up. And this has had some really horrible side effects. So this is the warehouse district um, in, in 1959. And then um, because the automobile needed so much space, basically the, the, that space, you know, the, the, the city was torn down um, in order to to make room for parking because you need you needed parking and there is this inconsistency this incompatibility between the a city and, and and automobiles and I mean and to tear your city apart to, you know what the city the fabric of the city is to accommodate a mode of transportation is really a, a backward thing to do it, I mean the, it's more appropriate to take the city that you, that you want and have and then build an appropriate transportation system that doesn't require you to, to, to uh, disassemble your city in order to, to do that. And then all these huge surface parking lots, they, they have the effect of deadening the city. It's, you know, it's hard to walk from here to here. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a good living experience anymore. And, the, and then you get into this vicious cycle where it's good to drive, it's not so good to walk, and then people move out. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with all, all of that. Because it's very important to really understand that there is a fundamental incompatibility between people and cars. That the spaces that work best for people are, are spaces that are safe, that don't even have any particular sense of direction, where, where kids can run around. But those are, are horrible spaces for cars because they have to creep along at two or three miles an hour in, the, in those spaces. And spaces that are good for cars are straight, distraction-free spaces where the, the cars can drive quickly. And those are, by definition, deadly spaces for people. So we've taken a good fraction of the living environment in our cities, and we've actually made, them, made that space toxic to people that, that live there. Um, and, and again, this is, the, um, this is, this is New York from a, from a, a ways back, but I, I would suspect that, 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 that this was, could have been a, a neighborhood in Cleveland too. The, our streets used to be the places where kids played, where the life of communities happened. And we've taken these streets, which used to really be multi-purpose things that serve the community in a lot of different ways, and we've given them only over to traffic. And as a result, all of these other things which are so important for people to live, for kids to play, for community, we, we've deadened the, our streets and, and our cities, and as a result, they're not desirable places to, to, to live anymore. Um, and Enrique Penulosa said it best. He said, you can have a city that is friendly to cars or friendly to people. You cannot have both. And it's really important to understand that there, that there is, you have to make a choice. And that, that if you are choosing to move vehicles around, you're deadening the, the city for people. And that if you want to make the city livable, you have to start doing things that aren't good for, for driving around. Um, and th this is a, a, a picture of public square here. When you look at this, I mean, you look at just the streets here. I mean, if you look at the, all of this space here is dead. And, you know, the time it takes to get across these streets, this is not a space that has been designed with people in mind. This is a space that's designed solely to move traffic. And as a result, it's not an inviting or, or lively um, space for people. And, and, and it, this has happened, you know, all over Cleveland and all over cities, you know, around the country and, and around the world. Um, but at the same time, all of this space here is really a huge potential. It doesn't have to be a dead, toxic space. It can be easily repurposed, and, and there are a lot of great ways to do that. Um, here again, you have um, Public Square back in, in 1916 and, and 2008. And if you look at the people, look how they used to just wander across the street. This is before the automobile came to dominate the streets where people it was these were people oriented streets you still have great transit here you have you have the streetcar so it was clearly you could move a lot of people in this space but this was a an environment that was 
was friendly to people, where people could, could move around as they saw fit, where it wasn't just about being dominated by the car. And you really have to go back this far to remember that there was a different way that people behaved and that cities, cities are really about walking. And that walking used to dominate in a way that, that we've really forgotten. And that this is what the cities can be again, but it, it takes planning and it takes, um, it, it really, it takes prioritizing uh, pedestrians. And, and here's, here's another picture. I mean, this is a lively environment. This is, this is certainly, I mean, Euclid Avenue, this is a busy street that's got lots going on, but look how relaxed the people crossing the street are. I mean, this, and this is as, as busy a street as you were going to have. It's a very different sort of way of living. And streets were, were much slower. And even though you're moving people, it happened at a, at a, at a safe, human-oriented speed. And that's something that, that is really, I think, great about cities and something that can be recovered, but this is the choice. You can't have people be a people-oriented space if it's about moving automobiles, and this is the choice. And I would say that for, for dense cities that, that have you know, buildings as, as dense as exist in Cleveland today, this is really, in many ways, a more appropriate transportation mix than what we have today. Because um, I've sort of spent a lot of time thinking all right, well, you know, we, the automobile is a new technology. You don't want to just throw it out. But what if, given all of the technology options that we have today, what is really the correct mix for a city? And I think in a large, large sense, it's what existed 100 years ago because the streetcar network was really great. It's, it moved a lot of people around, and it moved them in a, in a spatially efficient way, in a socially friendly way. And, and I think that there's a lot of you looking forward, you know, what things are going to be like 100 years from now. A lot of it is actually probably our role models are, are probably looking back in time where we can remember what it was like to have a pedestrian-oriented environment. Um, and again, these are streets today. I mean, this, this is a hostile, toxic place for people. I mean, this is, this, is, this is not a good place for humans to live. But again, this is... This is our own environment. This is we have poisoned our own environment with traffic. Um, and, and basically, all of these ideas about what the consequences for the human living environment were for the 20th century, they weren't considered in our planning decisions. But now that we've had 100 years of experience with the impact of the automobile on cities, we, we recognize that we really have to start thinking about these things. And again, here's another picture. This has been um, kind of... Uh, two photos mixed together. The outside is today. This is back in 1959. Just so you remember like how many people used to be on the streets, how rich the, the urban environment was, and, and how that's been lost, and, and it's and something potentially that can be reclaimed. Um, and, and Fred Kent from the Project for Public Spaces ha has a great quote. If you plan for city, cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. And we've been all about cars and traffic, and it's really time to, to start changing the way we do things. Because traffic damages the human living environment. When you ask people, you know, what's the problem with, with cars, a lot of people will say, you know, you know, pollution or global warming, but it, there's really something much more profound and that's the impact it has on how humans live in their own environment and it's it, important to realize that. And there's been some great academic research on this topic that, that illuminates the, this point and, um, and this is, I'm going to present work here that was done by uh, Professor Donald Appleyard at the University of California at Berkeley. And what Professor Appleyard and his students did is that they, he chose uh, groups of three streets in, in San Francisco that were chosen to be as similar as possible in every dimension except for one, and that one dimension was the amount of traffic on, on the street. So he, he has the heavily traffic street, the moderately traffic street, and the lightly traffic street. And he is in, and his graduate students went to these streets and they surveyed about a third of the people that lived on each of these streets. And they asked them very, very detailed questions about how they spent their time, how, what their relationships with their neighbors were, who their friends were, um, how they perceived their living environment. And then he plotted this information on some really excellent charts, and that's what I have here. So this chart shows two things. It shows these dots, these little dots here. This shows places where, where people gather outside. 
And what you see is on the lightly trafficked street, there's just a lot more places where people gather than on a heavily trafficked street. And to a large extent, this, this makes sense because no one likes hanging out uh, in, the, in a bunch of loud, dangerous, polluting traffic. And on a, on a, on a quiet street, it, it's very pleasant to hang out. And when you're on a lightly trafficked street, you have more people spending time outside, you have more chance for people to meet, and you have more friendship connections form. And that's what these lines are. Each of these lines represents a friendship connection. And what you see is that you have a much denser web of social connections on the lightly trafficked street than on the heavily trafficked street, where on the lightly trafficked pe street, people had um, three friends uh, per average uh, for each person, whereas on the heavily trafficked street, less than one friend. So traffic reduces um, the number of friends that people have. And again, the number of friends you have is incredibly important. It, you know, it, it's what makes a community rich. It, it's what makes, you know, life so, you know, part of what's so, so uh, important in life. And, and traffic damages the, those social connections, but it's also a completely invisible harm. You don't see this sort of thing unless you stop and analyze it or really think about it. People could drive down these streets every day and not think, oh, I'm keeping neighbors from getting to know each other. I'm keeping kids from being able to cross the street to play with their friends. That, that almost never crosses the mind of drivers. Yet it's a real harm that, that's being done out there. Um, and what um, Professor Applegard also did is he gave people a map of their, their street and asked them to draw their home territory. And on the heavily trafficked street, people just drew their apartment or maybe the building that they lived in, whereas on the lightly trafficked street, they tended to draw the entire street. So again, traffic crushes our sense of home territory in the world. And again, this is an incredibly important thing, but you have to do work like this in, in order to be able to uh, illuminate that. Um, and, and it's also important to understand that, that the automobile is the most expensive transportation technology that, that a city can use. So what I have here are two groups of cities. I have the auto-centric cities, Houston, Atlanta, Phoenix, San Diego, with about 95% of all their trips being done by cars. And then I have the smart multimodal cities, Copenhagen, Singapore, Munich, Tokyo, where they have you know, 30, 50% of the, the trips by automobile. And what I have here is the percentage of metropolitan GDP spent on transportation. So you're basically spending 12 to 15 percent of your metropolitan GDP on transportation in the autocentric cities. And down here, it's four to six percent. So you can save eight percent of your GDP by having a smarter transportation system. And 8% of GDP is, is, is a lot. And they're basically able to do this a lot by substituting walking and cycling trips for automobile trips. If you put your buildings in the right place, in the right configuration, you don't need to have people going 20 miles to, to play soccer or to go to school or to go shopping and things like that. All of those things can be walking trips, which are much, much cheaper. And, and by doing smart planning, you can actually save a huge amount of money as a society. And in many ways, Cleveland is, is really fortunate because the, the core of Cleveland was built using what we would call transit-oriented development principles today. So the buildings are in the right place to get this sort of mix here. You just have to really have transportation, a transportation mix that, that matches the, the buildings that you, that you already have here. Um, and the automobile is, in many ways, a rural transportation technology that's been misapplied to cities. I mean, the car is excellent if you're driving around in a rural area. I think it's the best technology that you can have to get around a rural area. In a city, uh, I think it, it does a lot of harm, and there are a lot of other technologies that, that work better. And, and we really systematically degraded the human and living environment in most of the major cities around the world with the automobile. It's a very, very profound thing that's really damage these cities, and we're just beginning to come to grips with this. Um, and so the automobile as the dominant transportation technology in cities is a mistake for three classes of re reasons. One, it undermines the livability of the city in very, very profound ways. It's the sort of thing that, that actually you know, drives people out of the city, that, that, that degrades the quality of, pe of, of people's lives. It's also spatially incompatible with, with a dense ur urban environment. And it's also the most expensive way to build a city's transportation system. And, and you know, the, the core of Cleveland is really, a, you know, it's a beautiful city. You know, I come here, you know, the, the architecture is great. The, the public spaces are great. Um, but, you know, it, it's been 
planned as if it, it aspires to be a suburb. It will never be a good suburb. It can be a great city, but it, 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 Cleveland, the, the heart of Cleveland just can never be a great suburb. Um, and, and there's, there's a, you know, a lot that can be done to, I mean, the, 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 the buildings are in the right place. So everything else is, is really, is easy to fix and it can be walkable and bikeable. And, and it's also important to understand that now there, you're really seeing the, this generational change where the, it used to be the suburbs were considered the way of the future and, and you know, everyone aspired to live a, a suburban lifestyle. And now that, that's just not true anymore. You have young people want to live an urban lifestyle. They realize there's something special about living in a city. I mean, suburbs, I grew up in a suburb. It's, they're kind of boring places. Not that much happens. I mean, cities are vibrant. They attract people. The, the compelling logic behind cities, it, it's still there. You know, and it's the same logic that's been there for, for thousands of years. And, and, and the, that logic is so powerful that, that, that cities are really beginning to see a resurgence it's all, all over. Um, and, and people are driving less, particularly um, you know, young people who, you know, it, being stuck in traffic and driving around all day, it's not a great way to live. It, it's, it's boring, it's, it's frustrating, it's expensive, it's unhealthy. Um, I, I just had an experience where a, a few weeks ago where I'm, I'm, in, I'm hiring a, a guy who's a quantitative trader from Chicago and he, he's going to be moving to New York. And, and during the interview, I said to him, like, oh, you know, how do you feel about moving to New York? And he said, oh, I'm you know, really looking forward to it. I, uh, you know, I, I bike to work every day in Chicago. I hope to do that in New York. He said, I grew up in Orange County, California, which is, you know, you know is the, you know, absolute, you know, epitome of car domination. And, and he said, I, I grew up in Orange County, and I, and I never want to live where I have to drive again. And, and kids are realizing this. It, it's... You know, the, the, the myth that we've been sold by the auto companies of the freedom and, you know, all, all that comes with the car, it's not, it's not really that liberating. You're stuck in traffic. You don't know your neighbors, all of those things. And people want a different lifestyle. And, and all of this plays to Cleveland's strength. The city itself is, is, you know, from a physical point of view, you know, magnificent. It just has to I embrace I its urban essence. Um, and cycling is also up, too. And, and cycling is a great transportation technology for for a city um, I you know I'm sure you've probably seen if you're if you're paying attention to streets there's there's more cyclists out there you can you can see it in New York it, it's it's a it's a trend that's happening all over the country and, and, and around the world and and it, it so happens that I mean it, it's a great transportation technology I I, I cycle uh, five and a half miles to work um, e e each way and if you take you know, the downtown Cleveland, you go out five and a half miles, you're, you're encompassing a huge, huge swath of the city. And, and I mean, it takes me 25 minutes. So what you really have with, you know, with the, with, you know there are lots of trips here that are one, two, three, five miles that, that are great cycling trips. And it, it, it's, it, it's, you know, it's a great way to get around. It's good for your health. It's environmentally friendly. It's socially friendly in that it, it, it's good for the fabric of the city. And it's the sort of technology cities really should be embracing because it, it, it's so healthy for the city. And this is also how people want to live. Young people getting out of college today, a good fraction of them, you know, this is the lifestyle they want. And they're choosing where, where to live. There's, um, there's a guy who is um, active in, in trying to make uh, Detroit uh, more livable, and he's, he runs a big law firm there. And, and he says that he has a very hard time hiring lawyers to come and move to Detroit. He says that people would, unemployed lawyers would rather work at Starbucks in San Francisco than move to Detroit. And there's a lot of truth, a lot of truth to that, that there are people who, um, you know, really feel strongly about that. And, and Cleveland has the ability, if it makes itself more cycling and pedestrian friendly, to attract um, this younger generation. And these are the people with energy and spirit and dynamism who, who can revitalize a city and, and an economy. Um, and, and it's also important to understand great urban environments work for families. And so it really means thinking about your, your city and saying, like, okay, you know, for the family, I mean, I actually have a cargo bike very much like this, and I, I drive my or cycle my kids around New York in it. But for people, if this is how they're getting their kids around, 
Uh, is your city friendly? You know, uh, you know, can the kids get to school uh, by bicycle? You know, are, are there things like that? And, and with the way the streets in, in Cleveland are programmed, the answer is pretty much no. They've been made to be hostile to people. It's pretty easy to fix. It's not hard to dial down traffic speeds. It's, it's pretty cheap to put in bike lanes and things like that. But instead of designing your, your, your city with the movement of vehicles in mind, where the design vehicle is some truck that has to drive you know, around these streets, if this is your design vehicle for your city, you think very differently about how you plan your, your city. And if you design your city for people like this, then you get a friendly city that people want to live in. And if you design it for cars, then these people can't be in your city and they're forced to go elsewhere. Um, so first of all, it's important to understand that the modal split for a city is determined by government policies. So if you build a lot of roads that look like this, people are going to drive. And if you build protected cycle tracks and, and have good transit, this is what people will do. Each person individually responds to a set of in incentives in front of them. And you can give them incentives that make it inviting to cycle and take transit, or you can give them incentives that makes it inviting to, to drive. And we've been working very hard for a long time to give people incentives to drive. In, in cities like Copenhagen, you have 37% bicycle mode share and, and probably a, a similar amount in transit. I mean, this is compares to probably, you know, I'm guessing, you know, mid-90, mid uh, automobile mode share in, in Cleveland. And again, infrastructure like this, it's unsafe to cycle. You can't walk ac across this. You, you, are build, you are actually building impediments to the most uh, urban friendly um, ways of getting around. So I have something I call the five pillars of a good transportation policy. Walking, transit, land use planning, automobile suppression, and bicycle promotion. So, so walking, I mean, it is, it is the most Basic thing, cities are about walking, and, and more than anything else, and again, Cleveland is, is, you know, has a city that was built as a walking city, and you can walk across you know, a good fraction of the urban core in you know, 15, 20, 20 minutes. It, it's, it's pretty easy, but it, 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 this needs to be embraced, and walking needs to be promoted as a mode, and you have to have planners and engineers consciously looking at the roads really working to make it friendly to walk, easy to cross the streets. I mean, just everything from the, the signal light timing and the, and the walk signals and, um, and, and also having inviting streetscapes. When you, if you just are walking block after block of kind of you know, dead surface parking lots, that's not an interesting place to walk. It doesn't engage people. So you have to build your whole environment really you know, thinking about walking as an important fundamental planning principle. Um, and transit. I mean, every great city in the world, um, you know, transit is the is the workhorse for those cities. And Cleveland, I mean, you have the best bus rapid uh, transit system in the country. It seems like you're pioneering that way, and, and it's an acknowledged success. So there's there's a lot of strength to to build off of here, and you can see what's working, and, it, and it's not that hard to expand it. Um, land use planning. Again, you know, if you build stuff like this which is pretty typical all around the US, the only thing people can do is drive. You're not giving them any choice at all. This is a bus rapid transit corridor in, in Curitiba, Brazil, where you have you know, high density housing right next to the, the buses, so it's very easy for people to walk to the buses because every transit trip starts and ends as a walking trip. And so you have to put, make you, the area around your transit walkable and cluster those uses. And again, Cleveland was built that way. You already have everything in, pl in place. It, 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 it should be easy to, to embrace that, at least in the, in the urban core. And, and also land use planning. I'm sure you're familiar with sprawl and the, and the, the problems that, that it can cause a region. But this is a, a nice picture that shows that this is Atlanta 2.5. 5 million people in the metropolitan region, uh, uh, Barcelona, 2.8 million people. And just look at the, you know, the extra you know, land that's consumed. And this is expensive. Think about all how many more roads need to be maintained, how many more sewers, all of that extra infrastructure. It's actually remarkably efficient to live in, in a city because you have more people sharing the same infrastructure. So density is really cheap. And, and, and can be very cost effective. Um, so on automobile suppression, 
there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done. I, I'd like to uh, talk about highway removal. This is Milwaukee that they, they, they tore down this highway to make it a, uh, uh, a better, uh, you know, to, to help connect their environment. I mean, structures like this really, you know, cut, a, you know, a, like a knife through a city. You can't get from one side to the other. It, you know, it's, it's, it's unpleasant. It, it's, and so by, by tearing down highways, you can re-knit the city together. Um, and, and so this is certainly something to consider. There, there's, there's a lot of other things that can be done. I think parking is, and managing parking is, is, is very important because um, there, there, are, there's, I mean, parking, it, without, if you can't park, you can't drive. And it is the ultimate tool if you are interested in, in, in dialing back the amount of, of driving that you have. And there's a lot of things that can be done to more smartly manage your, your, the limited uh, curb space that you have. There, the, this is uh, from San Francisco, the, uh, their Park Smart program where they have uh, dynamically adjusted prices to, to always have uh, vacancy targets on their street. Um, and there's also rethinking how you, what you do with the space that's currently given to parking. This is uh, Minneapolis where people are, are reclaiming what was a parking spot for, for human-oriented space. Or Queens, New York. This used to be a parking lot, and now, now it's a park. And you have a, you know, if you look at, at, at Cleveland, there's a huge fraction of the, the, the city that is given over to, to surface parking lots. And those are, those are really deadening things for a city. And so thinking about how you can re-envision those for other uses, for parks, for, for other spaces, for human-oriented things, there's a, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, also taxing driving. I mean, again, driving is the most socially, environmentally harmful way to, uh, to get around. And explicitly taxing it, I think, is, is a very good thing to do. London has a congestion charge. Singapore and Stockholm have congestion charges. And they take this money and they feed it back into the transit system. So you, you then are giving people better options uh, about how to get around. Because, of course, funding gets to be important for everything. Um, I'd also like to talk about um, a, a couple... Um, examples of how you can reorient your, your, your road network. And that this is uh, Berkeley, California here. And um, part of the reason I highlight Berkeley is that it's a grid. So again, Cleveland's a grid. This is a grid. I think what, a lot of what they do here is, um, can be very applicable to, to um, good chunks of, of Cleveland. So what, it might be a little hard to see, but there's lots of little white streets in here. And what they've done is they have traffic calm these white streets so, and to keep traffic off of it. And they, and they um, are funneling all the traffic onto these, um, onto these black streets here. And so what you have is on, for these white streets, um, they're using everything from diagonal diverters, traffic circles. Um, they change the direction on streets. So it's basically very difficult. You know, it, these, the white streets don't work for through traffic. So local traffic can get to, you know, people can drive to their house. They can get there if they need to go, but the, the, the through traffic is, is kept off of those streets. And so what they're able to do is they're probably able to protect 80% of the streets in the city from the harmful impact of, of, of through traffic by using techniques like this. And again, the, these things are, are pretty cheap and easy to put in. And I would think that even in the, in the heart of downtown Cleveland, you could probably reclaim 50% of the streets in the city for human-oriented use um, by doing something like this. And again, you, I mean, one of the good things about Cleveland is you have so much extra road capacity, you really don't have any congestion issues at all. You can take out 50% of your road network, and it's not a problem. And you, know, you can do that, have still have everybody drive around like they were. They might have to park a block away or two blocks away, but that's, that's not so bad. And in the course of those walking, two, walking those two blocks, they might actually walk in front of a store or a restaurant and engage in some commercial transaction as opposed to zipping in and out of the city as quickly as possible. Um, and this is, again, cheap, easy to do, 
and, and I think very applicable and, and, and something that, that is not being done that much. I'd also like to talk about traffic cells. This is a, a map of uh, central Honingen, which is the largest city in northern Holland. It's also the city in the world that has probably done the most right in terms of transportation planning. In Honingen, they have 57% bicycle mode share. 57% of all trips in the city are uh, by bicycle. Um, and what they have in the center of the city is they have traffic cells. So this gray area here is a car-free zone. They only have a freight delivery, that sort of thing. But regular traffic can't, can't drive on, on, on these streets here. So you have, basically this is pedestrians and cyclists only. And what they've done is they've used this pedestrianized area to, to break up the center of the city into three traffic cells. One here, one here, and one here. And so if you're, you can drive here, but if you want to get from here to here, you have to go out and around and back in again. And so that keeps through traffic um, out of these areas. And again, you can create something like this in, um, in Cleveland just by taking um, basically you know, two streets that are perpendicular to each other and closing both of them fully off to traffic and closing even off the through streets. And you can create a traffic cell configuration. And again, people can drive you know, a few blocks away from that park, do everything they want, but within that neighborhood, it can be completely pedestrian friendly, cycling friendly, all that sort of stuff. And you can also get these pedestrianized boulevards, you know, while you're doing that. So there, there's enormous potential. Um, and, and I think that this is something that really should be considered. Um, also promoting cycling. Um, and again, it, it's, it's about building good protected cycling infrastructure so people are safe. This is, this is Chicago. Rahm Emanuel, who just became mayor there, um, has announced a plan to put in 100 miles of protected cycle infrastructure in four years. That is a huge amount, and he put th this lane in within two months of, of him becoming mayor. It's, this stuff is easy to build. This is paint and these little plastic cones. This is not expensive stuff. I mean, this can be done as a demonstration project. Um, and, and you can transform your streets. And the streets in Cleveland are so wide. You have so much extra capacity. It's easy to do this stuff. And if there is the political will to do it, you could build out a protected cycle network here in, in a matter of, of months or a couple years. It's really easy. It's just a question of political will. This is not a super expensive, difficult engineering task. It's just a question of deciding to do that. And once you have an infrastructure like this, it, it, where it's safe, there, there's a saying that if a bicycle lane is, isn't safe for an eight-year-old to ride on, it's not a bicycle lane. And there's a lot of truth to that. And if you want families to come here, families who want their kids to ride on bikes, then this is the sort of stuff that, that you have to build. And it's easy, it's cheap, and it can revitalize the city. Um, it's also important to understand that bicycles can be a significant transportation technology in a dense city. So you have Amsterdam, 40% of the people get around by bicycle. Munich, 20%. Um, Tokyo, 20%. Um, you know, these are big global you know, cities that are moving a significant fraction of, of, their, of their people on, on bicycle. And, and it's, but it's a question of, of putting in the cycling facilities and actually promoting it and making it an inviting way to get around. Um, I'd also like to talk about a, a, a couple things. This picture highlights two things. One, this is a map of London and these little pinkish areas here are, are slow speed zones. And I think slow speed zones are, are, can be very important because one, they're really easy to implement or, or you know, it's just a policy change. Um, you know, it's the decision to do it plus some speed cameras and you actually can have traffic moving 20 miles per hour, which does a lot to make this, the streets safer for pedestrians, for cyclists, um, that sort of thing. But the other thing that's highlighted here is that you know all of these little blobs? The, what the, the way London is doing this is that they have a program where an individual community can request to be a, a slow speed zone, and and so they started it as a, a pilot program in just a couple neighborhoods, and it was popular, and the people liked it, and people in, the, in adjoining neighborhoods um, wanted it, and so they they started asking for changes like this. And, and what you're going to see is just in, in, a, in a few more years, all of London is basically going to opt into being a slow speed zones. And, and I think that this, this sort of uh, empowering local communities to make decisions about how their streets are programmed is, 
is is very important and you know empowers the community you 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 get you know good neighborhood buy in and it doesn't have to just be for slow speed zones it can be you know any sort of change a change in parking policy putting you know you could build out a bike network you know all all these sorts of things um, and so by learning you know from their experiences of, of history in in Cleveland and other cities um, Cleveland has the opportunity to recapture its urban glory and revitalize the city. Um, and you can have great plazas, um, great public spaces, big and small, little nuanced uh, pop-up cafes like this. Um, you know, a comprehensive pedestrian network. So for people who choose to walk, you can get across the city without ever really being exposed to, to nasty traffic. Um, Great boulevards. This is Champs Elysees. You know, really wide sidewalks. You know, and they, and you know, with you know, big sidewalk cafes. I mean, this is great urban living. This is what will draw people into town. This is what will make people want to live here. And you have the road space. The wide, the streets are so wide. You can easily do this. And and, and you know, it's rethink of yourself along the lines of, uh, of Paris. I mean, that's a great model. Um, and still get good vehicle access to all streets. So you know, for you know, emergency vehicles or, or transit, you know, you can have streets that were, you know, which are great for people, but, but also for, you know, all of the excuses you'll hear, you know, you can, you can, you, you can have people friendly streets that still work for the necessary minimum set of vehicles. Um, and if the choice is, is basically um, up to you. So thank you very much. And that is my talk. Yeah. <laughs>